Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Interracial relationships come with their own complexities. I know, because I happen to be in one. So I know there are a lot of questions that come up. Questions like, how does your partner think about race? How do you talk about it? What works and what doesn't? Kim McLaren writes about race and dating in her piece, Race Wasn't an Issue to Him, which was an issue to me. It's read by Lorraine Toussaint. She's starring now in the shows The Village and Into the Badlands. And you might also know her as V in Orange is the New Black. His name was Jerry, a nice man, late 40s, funny and smart, divorced with two grown children, a social worker who had dedicated his professional life to working with troubled kids. He was also, let's be honest, the first to come around. He was the first man after my own divorce to raise an eyebrow to take an interest after my ex not only moved out, but moved on. Funny and smart and dedicated to troubled kids is all admirable, but in truth, I would have said yes to a drink with a four-foot gap-toothed troll had one smiled in my direction. The self-confidence of a 40-year-old divorced mother of two is a shaggy thing. So, the fact that Jerry was also white, I noted, but decided to file away for now. Why worry about it right out of the gate? Yes, race had been an issue in my marriage. Not the issue, perhaps, but an issue nonetheless. What I did not know was whether race arose as a problem because I am black and my ex is white, or because I am a person who grapples with race and he is not. That my ex does not grapple with race, he would not dispute. He does not care to read, think, or talk about it, and he wondered why I did. My ex believed I always went looking for race, but I didn't. Race came looking for me. And when it did, I would stand and call its name. When officials in our inner ring suburb talked about closing our borders against a wave of non-resident students sneaking into our schools, when a white woman at my gym reached up uninvited and petted my locks like she was petting a dog, when my sick mother received one level of medical care and my ex's sick sister received another, At such times, he tried to understand my feelings, but he did not share them, and even talking about it made him uncomfortable. It's a dividing line as real as any in America, those who grapple with race and those who do not. But like most dividing lines, it's impossible to tell on which side a person stands by looking at them, or at least that's what I thought at the time. So why get ahead of myself with Jerry? Why dig for landmines when I may not make it past the way he slurps his beer? We met for drinks. Sparkwise, I felt little, but we ended up talking and laughing easily for more than an hour. I told him I was a writer. He told me his five favorite books and how they had shaped his life. He told me he'd gone to a seminary as a boy and eventually left the Catholic Church. I told him I'd been raised a Pentecostal, but mellowed into Methodism as an adult. We talked about our children, travels, mutual love of the blues, and mutual dislike of the cold. And then he said he would like to read my books. He thought he would like them. 
I said he might not. How do you deal with it when people you know don't like your work? He asked. I quoted a playwright whose name I couldn't remember, who admitted in an interview that he told his friends if there was a choice between being honest and being kind in talking about his work, they should choose to be kind. Don't value your opinion over my feelings, the playwright said. Jerry nodded. Most people use honesty like a weapon. Like a switchblade, I said, like a bayonet. They slice up your heart with their ugly, hurtful words, and then, while you're bleeding on the floor, they hand you a Band-Aid. I was only being honest. Honesty is overrated, Jerry agreed. So the following day, when he emailed his attraction, I tried to be both honest and kind. No spark, I wrote. But he was great, good company. If he was looking for the one, I was probably not going to be her. But if he simply sought intelligent dinner companionship some Friday evening, I'd be more than game. Not a bayonet, I thought, but a butter knife. But still it hurt. Ouch, he replied, and disappeared. By the time he resurfaced a few months later, I had suffered through two terrible blind dates, joined an online dating service, carried on several email conversations that died, actually talked on the phone with a few men, met three for drinks, backed away carefully from each, then canceled the service. A few of these men were black, the others white, and in no case did I find anything remotely resembling chemistry. In fact, so utterly lacking in connection with these encounters that it made me appreciate anew how rare is connection. In the face of human isolation, race seemed to retreat a little. So, when Jerry called again, I decided to let the spark thing coast, because at least he and I could talk. My wounds are licked, Jerry said. Have dinner with me. Why not, I said. Maybe in time the spark would come. We talked and laughed for four hours, then necked like teenagers in a parking lot in the rain. The next day we emailed and text messaged each other. It was all so much fun, such a heady relief after the months of loneliness. But then on our third date, things changed. First, he was late, and I was irritated. Earlier, I'd had a frustrating discussion with several white undergraduates in my Literature of Slavery class. All semester, I had struggled to teach them to think critically about race and slavery and history, to have them challenge their assumptions. They insisted, for example, that racial divisions were as old as time and that the myth of African inferiority preceded slavery, not, as I suggested, the other way around. And, they argued, that racial genetics were more than skin deep, whether I wanted to believe it or not. How else to account for the way black athletes dominate most professional sports? That evening, when I shared my frustrations with Jerry, he wondered if the students didn't have a point. What about all those Kenyan marathon runners, he asked. Isn't it possible there's some genetic reason for that? Isn't it possible blacks are just better athletes than whites? A perfectly innocent question, yet something small and painful flickered inside my chest. Logically, if one accepts a genetic physical superiority of blacks, one must also accept the possibility of intellectual superiority in whites. Did he not consider that notion? Did he reject it out of hand or subconsciously believe it? And if I wondered these things out loud, would he, like my ex, 
judge me bitter or oversensitive. I'd mentioned an essay I'd given my students in which the anti-racism advocate Tim Wise suggests that no one brought up in America can claim to be free of racist indoctrination, that doing so only perpetuates the crime. What Wise says is that we must all recognize and confront the legacy of the past, I explained. I don't think everyone is racist, Jerry said. Maybe racialized, but that's not such a bad thing. By now my hands were trembling, so I did not ask what he meant by that. I had a feeling that even if he tried to explain, I would not understand. I engage with race, but not all black people do. I know several interracial couples in which both people swear race is never an issue, almost never comes up at all. I believe them, but it amazes me. And I know one thing, I can never join that pack. My ex did not grapple with race, at first because he did not have to, being a white man in America, and later because it frightened him. This difference was a small but steady river that ran between us, and the more he tried to ignore it, the more I clawed at the banks, and the more I clawed at the banks, the larger the river swelled, until, at last, we were engulfed. A black person who grapples with race cannot be with a white person who doesn't. Whether a black person who grapples with race can be with a black person who doesn't is a different and unresolved question for me, but on the first point, I'm solid. So when Jerry called and asked if I would meet him for a drink, I agreed. But this time I went only to tell him. We met at a bar with billiards. He wanted to teach me to play, but I said, we wouldn't have time. I can't see you again, I said. He blinked with surprise. Why? He said finally. I used my bayonet. Because you're white, and it costs too much for me to date a white man. It cost me to be married to a white man for 13 years. I can't do it again. That's ridiculous, he said after a minute. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Which proves my point, I said. It's not ridiculous. You can't be with any white man. No, I don't think I can. I may as well face it, because after all, Jerry was a good man who worked with troubled kids and lived his life open to relationships with people of different races. And yet I couldn't be with him, even though, unlike my ex, he did seem willing to grapple with race. But he was nearly 50, and his grappling, apparently, was just beginning, whereas mine started at five. For nearly 50 years he'd lived in America, and yet it surprised him that race might even be an issue for us. There was an innocence in this, an innocence born of being white, an innocence I could neither share nor abide. It costs me too much, I repeated. We were silent for a minute. Behind us, balls clicked and people laughed. And now, Jerry said, it's costing me. That's Lorraine Toussaint reading Kim McLaren's essay, Race Wasn't an Issue to Him, Which Was an Issue to Me. We'll catch up with Kim after the break. Kim McLaren's essay came out back in 2006. And when it was published, she says she got a lot of angry messages. It just got characterized as she hates white people. 
And that's a very easy way to dismiss me and dismiss what I was saying. What I was simply saying was these issues are real. They continue to exist. This country continues to have issues of white supremacy and racial injustice. And I cannot be with a white man who refuses to acknowledge that. And anybody in 2019 who continues to deny the reality of racial injustice, I think, is really problematic. So I actually feel in some ways vindicated. Kim's one regret about the piece was Jerry's reaction to it. Jerry did read the piece, and he was furious at first. He was furious, even though we did not use his last name, of course. And to me, Jerry wasn't the point of that essay. Jerry is representative of a lot of people in this society, and that's what I was really writing about. I wasn't writing about him. I was writing about the unwillingness of a large portion of American society to address these issues head on and how I couldn't be in an intimate relationship with one of those people. So, but yeah, Jerry was pissed, but Jerry got over it. (laughs) Kim is in a relationship now with a man she met three years ago. And a year and a half ago, they had a commitment ceremony. I don't believe in marriage anymore, so that's a separate issue. But yes, I'm I'm well partnered. And ironically, or not ironically, he is is white. He's a white man. And um, he's the love of my life. I call him the unicorn, actually because he's a magical creature who nobody believes exists, um, but he does. He acknowledges his own white male privilege, and he does not discount or diminish my experience, which is what was happening with Jerry, right? Like, so if I have an experience, if I'm in a department store and somebody follows me um, and accuses me of shoplifting, and I come home and tell him, he doesn't say, oh, you were imagining it. He says, that really... You know, all right, right. He starts cursing with me, and then we hug, and then we go on and have dinner. That's the end of it, right? It's like we don't have to talk about race because he acknowledges the reality. It's like you don't have to keep arguing about the wetness of water unless one person is denying that it is. And Kim says that for her, acknowledging another person's reality is essential to intimacy. I'm a big fan of James Baldwin. He is my spiritual guide, my guru, um, and he really said the writer's job is to look right at the heart of things and to tell the truth about the way human beings are and what it means to be human in this world in order to make the world a more human dwelling place and a more humane dwelling place. And so, and that's really all I'm trying to do because we can't make things better until we acknowledge the way things are. That's Kim McLaren. She's a professor in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing at Emerson College and the author of the new book, Womanish, A Grown Black Woman Speaks on Love and Life. We've got more after the break. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times. Kim's essay was published... uh, 13 years ago at this point, almost 13 years ago. And what I really appreciate about the way that she approached this essay is her, you know, race is just, it's such a third rail kind of thing where as soon as you start talking about race and being aware of race, people have heated reactions. And what's always troubling to me is that the nuance gets sort of overrun by that instant response and that hot take. And, you know, it just pushes aside all of the complication and all of the tortured feelings and all of what people are trying to process. And I'm just always on the side of, like, say it, you know, say it, tell your story. It's going to invite criticism. It's going to invite empathy. But um, these things are better to put these personal stories out there and have them talked about and have that stuff brought to the surface than to be silent about it. And here's Lorraine Toussaint. Modern Love is uh, one of the columns that my now husband would read to me in bed every week. He would save it and cut it out and bring it home to read to me in bed. And so that's how I came to know it modern love. It was a ritual with us. And I'm black and my husband is white. And um, we talk about race all the time in our house. It's never far away from how we are thinking, how we're talking, how we perceive the world. So this piece 
really did resonate with me for several different reasons. Thanks again to Lorraine for reading this week's piece. You can see her now in NBC's The Village and the AMC series Into the Badlands. She's also in the upcoming films Fast Color and Sprinter. Next week, DeWanda Wise. Luke got home as our date was winding down. He joined us in the living room for a few minutes before leaving us alone to say the kind of goodbyes that linger a little too long at the beginning of relationships. That night, I lay next to my fiancé and told him about the woman I was falling for. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed, with help this week from Paul Vikas. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Special thanks to Samantha Hennig, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Additional music, courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.